Thank once again, thank you for inviting me. It was difficult for me to come from Paris here. <laughs> That's like... Everyone's crying you were in Paris. Okay. <laughs> How do you go forward? Where are you going tomorrow? Another disaster? Where are you going tomorrow? <laughs> Maui. <laughs> <laughs> Does this go forward? Oh, I have questions, yes. Yes, I have three polling questions, right? They're simple, they're nothing. So this is the microgrid. I think the Canadian one and the US one, I think, are similar, right? If, the, if so, the microgrid has been approved for the yes. treatment of high-risk functional MR, high-risk primary DGN MR, for selected patients of both high-risk and functional MR, and of course, for all groups. And the answer is... Okay. So I think most people got it right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a nice question, okay? This is an 82-year-old gentleman with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy year for 25%, severe function MR arising from the central part of the valve, NYHA class three, and the patient happens to be your uncle. So you have options. You can do a transcatheter mitral valve repair with a mitral clip, mitral annuloplasty with a Carolin device, surgical repair replacement, or transcatheter mitral valve replacement, either Transapical or transeptal, whatever you want. Well, if you don't like your uncle, you might go with number with okay. D. But <laughs> so let's see what the answer is. Okay. <laughs> okay. But this third question is more interesting because you don't have to answer it. What if the same scenario, but the patient happens to your mother-in-law you don't like? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know what the is. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I remember I had the uh, fortune or misfortune of treating uh, Lee Benson's sister's husband, right? And I think he did well for some time. Yeah, yeah, I remember he had an ejection fraction of 20%. 10 most important keys to success of mitoclip. I know there are a lot of pediatric cardiologists there. How many people are doing mitoclip or involved in a mitoclip program? So that's quite small, actually. You can use it in, you can use it in kids in the tricuspid valve. So these are my conflicts. I'm actually, I get money from all companies, so I'm so conflicted that I'm actually very neutral. <laughs> so. <laughs> so when it comes to uh, mitoclip, as you can see, this was based on the Alfieri stitch, which is a very simple operation of putting leaflets together and uh, coapting co the leaflets exactly where it leaks from. It was a very simple operation, and most surgeons, including Tyron David, thought it was just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. I, and, and truly, actually, he wrote one of the best papers on the Alfieri stitch, showing that in anterior leaflet prolapse, it actually works very well. Um, Alfieri, I remember I had the opportunity of meeting him in 2006, uh, when I first spoke about MitoClip, and no one believed me, of course. And when I was in Europe, there were six people in the audience. Three were from the company, and the other three were, from the, were just speakers. So there was actually no one. And the person sitting near me was Alfieri. So I met him for the first time. I said, wow. And he said, look, he said, how many have you done? I said, I've done 10 cases. And he said, OK. He says, nobody believed my operation, but you will live my dream. And that came true. Now, exactly 10 years later, there are over 60,000 cases done worldwide. So the mitral basically uh, catches the leaflets by between the ventricular arms and the atrial grippers, and then independently you bring the leaflets together. And the beauty of this procedure is that because there are no sutures through the leaflets, you can actually recapture, you can reposition, and if you don't like it, you can just come out. So it's reposition removable, and therefore it is useful in any patient, and it's therefore impeccably safe. Um, this is... NT is the new version of it. I should, I should, can I show you that? I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back to that. If you look at the grippers, you see uh, when the grippers go down, they go down completely. You see this, look at these grippers. Can you see how the grippers go down? They go right down, so they catch the leaflets in 180 degrees. And then you easily, well, the other one, it went just up, so the leaflets could slip out. So this one, it's easier to grasp the leaflets. That's the only difference. Um, this is what it looks like. You can see this is a flail posterior leaflet and you're gradually getting it, allowing the leaflets to drop. You drop the grippers, and then you close the clip under echo, and you get a double orifice valve, especially where it's flail, mm -hmm. all of this under control. And I know Eric loves this procedure. <laughs> <laughs> he just hates it. <laughs> so there's a couple of things about this vascular access. Uh, 
and I know Eric doesn't like way about it because there's no arterial access in the groin. No application. <laughs> it's a single venous stick, single perclose in the vein. Some cases are radial arterial lines. Some cases are right internal jugular vein. Our initial procedures used to take between four to five hours, sometimes six hours, right? And that would take four to five hours, sometimes six hours. <laughs> but now they take probably less than an hour. But the beauty is that even in those days when it took four to five hours, it still was a safe procedure. Do you agree with that, Eric? Yes, absolutely. That's right. Uh, when it comes to, uh, I'm going to talk about the success of the clip. What are the things that you should do? Uh, just common things. I'm going to talk about case selection, vascular access, imaging. So I'll go through simple things since I don't have much of time. Case selection, what John said, high risk or sick but not futile. You just remember, MitroClip is not a part of the ACLS or BLS program. We get patients who are 10% EF on three drips on ECMO, and they say, can we have a MitroClip? I said, no, it's better to plan the coffin instead. <laughs> so that's not good. Second is adequate mitral orifice. If your mitral valve area is less than 3.5, especially four with the cutoff, 3.5, then you should probably not try it, because if you do it, you're going to get mitral stenosis. Adequate leaflets to grasp. So I'm not going to go to the details, but if you have a flail segment, that flail cannot be too large, and the grip, the leaflets could not be too wide. So if you have a flail width of greater than 15 millimeters, you probably will not be able to tackle it with two uh, microclips. It will probably cause severe MR or severe MS. Avoid rheumatic heart disease. It doesn't. It's not effective in rheumatic valve disease because what happens is there's commercial fusion, and the leaflets are retracted. And therefore, when you do a microclip, you actually cause severe stenosis or you can't even grasp the leaflets. And finally, location of the pathology doesn't matter. This is important. When we started CRD, we only used to do middle A to P2 disease. And now it doesn't really matter. You can do a flail anterior leaflet in the lateral part or the posterior part or the middle. So it doesn't really matter. When it comes to uh, just overall, there's about uh, it's only transcatheter mitral valve repair option in U.S. and Canada. Am I correct about that? In Canada, do you have any other options? No, it nothing else. Pascal, but, not but it's not. But approved. Pascal is only not approved. Uh, yeah. Not approved. Yeah. Sixty thousand cases done worldwide. So if there are no any non-believers in the audience, it's too late. And in the U.S. and in Canada, it's been approved for primary degenerative MR. That's important. That's what's the question. Who are at prohibited risk for surgery? And the reason why I'm saying this is that. Worldwide, out of the 60,000 cases, probably 40,000 of cases are actually functional MR, especially in Europe, right? But, in, but there are clinical trials just been completed on functional MR, which I think is the biggest indication, uh, which will be out in, literally in the next three months. Uh, you have to choose your imaging specialist. This is very big, because this is a procedure which you can't do by yourself. And the echocardiography is as important as you. And in fact, this is a cardiac anesthesiologist who actually does the procedure with me. And I think if he was not there, we'd want to do this procedure. So that's important. Uh, the transeptal puncture is critical. And I actually want to correct your third mark. And I remember everyone keeps on saying that the transeptal puncture has to be high and posterior. But with the NT, that doesn't work. Because you look at a wall, like I, there's too much to detail the procedure. But just I want to tell you, you should be mid-fossa in the bicaval view and posterior in the short axis. Because if you That's go the with the NT. And XT, is, uh, the original one is going away. So you should use this as because otherwise what happens is here, you get a wall hugger. It goes okay. down from the anterior to posterior. You can't get coaxial. So it's better to be in mid fossa uh, in the mid and very posterior. Yeah. And the higher you get, high means distance is better. So I would say go to 4.5 to 5 centimeters. Don't stay even less than 4.5. So this is the fundamental difference with the two procedures. The same is with Pascal. Uh, this is the second thing which I do differently, which I find is continuous measurement of left atrial pressure. This is very helpful. So what I do is I do a transectal puncture. I put two wires up the pulmonary vein. Over one wire, you have a four French pigtail catheter. Over the other wire is the stiff guiding catheter. So you have a constant left atrial pressure monitoring. And the advantage of this is I found, especially in functional MR, if the LA pressure doesn't change, if you put a clip in, why even put the clip in? So that's why I, I always monitor the LA pressure. And what I find is the V wave often comes down. And that's a very good sign that actually this is being affected. So the pigtail and the, uh, the Through the same, the same, same venotomy. So the I'll show Same vein, but same guide catheter or side by side? Side by side. So this is what it looks like, Ziad. Uh, so this is what the two pictures are. 
But look at that. So through the same venotomy, you have one side, a pigtail, and one side, the guide catheter. But since it's only four French, it doesn't bleed. So you get a constant measurement of the LA pressure, and it's so useful. And the pigtail was just the skin, no, no, no small sheep in it. No, no, directly. Right. And you can see you get a V wave, and it's so nice, because you said you grasp the leaflets and you close the clip, you can just see the LA pressure changing. Mm -hmm. And if you see no change in LA pressure, then you should not leave the clip behind. Or sometimes when you're going for the second clip, and then you see the LA pressure is going up, that means you're causing more mitral stenosis, then you actually release the clip. So I, that's what I do in every case. Routinely. Routinely, uh, every single case. And also it gives you a double access through the FDM. And you don't get the same pressures if you do it from the guide, side port of the guide catheter. It's damped. So this is very useful. Uh, then, of course, orientation of the clip. This is critical that you orient the clip above and below because you want to be exactly perpendicular to the line of coaptation. So in the middle of the valve, we should be 6 and 12. On the sides of the valve, we should be probably 5 and 7, like oblique. And if you don't do that, this is what happens. So here's a patient who's got a frail P2 right in the middle. And then we see we put a clip in, but look what happens. When you put the clip in, there's a jet that has arisen from the medial side. And that's because you've distorted the valve, because you've not caught it correct. And so therefore, you should release it and then make sure that the orientation is correct. So we actually even see the orientation when it's below when we grasped. So several times. And this will be especially important when the next clip is coming out in a couple of weeks, the XT, which is with the long arms. And if you're distorted with the long arms, it's going to be even worse. So that's why this is important to always see the orientation. These are a couple of things which I do also for pos final positioning of the clip. So when you're positioning the clip about the, uh, exactly with the jet, even movements with the respirator moves the clip on either side. So what we do is we decrease the tidal volume or actually hold the respirator and make sure the clip and the valve are not moving and then I grasp the leaflets. So, because if you don't do that, you, you may be caught in a different position. So that's how you keep support. Sometimes we can keep the ventilator off for 10 minutes. See, because it doesn't matter, the saturation stays constant if it's at 100%. So, or you can just decrease the tidal volume. And then finally, you should always look at leaflet insertion in detail. So here you can see the leaflets are inside the clip and then you drop the atrial grippers and you can just see the leaflets are bouncing, but they're on the surface. You want to watch this happen, and then you close it partially, you can see it's still bouncing, and then finally when you close it to 60 degrees, it's actually caught the leaflets. But you should try to record these to make sure that you've actually got the leaflets. And then of course it's important for here, look at this one. Here's a patient who's got a leaflet, but watch this. Do you see there's a excessive movement leaflet motion? And then when we released it, it actually came out. And then we re grasp the leaflets, and now you see the second one, both the leaflets are stable inside the leaflets, and that means they're actually caught well. So if you see the gripper and there's excessive motion above the gripper, that means you haven't caught the leaflets very well. Uh, Ten pulse, low threshold to use a second clip. So if here is an example of a patient with a very wide jet, we put one clip in and you can see that you have a reduction of MR, but you still have a medial jet. You check the gradient, and if the gradient's adequate, then you put a second clip here, and then we put two clips in, and you see it's gone to trace MR. So you have a low threshold to put two clips. The advantage is two. One is a better reduction of MR. Two is the second clip stabilizes the first clip and releases tension on the leaflets itself. So that's why we have a low threshold of putting uh, two clips. And so here you can see this is a double orifice uh, with a good adequate orifice size. Uh, combined echo and invasive hemodynamics is helpful for the final result. So it's important, as you can see, when you do combined echo and hemodynamics, when you, each time you put a clip in, you, you just can't just look at color. You look at color, you see pulmonary vein flow, you measure mitral valve area, you measure the gradient, you see the 3D end phase before you release a clip. In addition, this is what I do, invasive. I see a reduction of the V wave or the mean LA pressure and usually improvements in cardiac output. This is, of course, the last part, but at least reduction of V wave and LA pressure is very important before I release a clip. So I look at both these things, and if both are correct, then actually I deploy the clip. And this is just an example. You can see over here, look at the prominent V wave. Immediately after one clip, you can see what happens to the A wave and V wave. It's right come down, 
and over there it's come down and see the cardiac outputs going up from 5.2 to 6 liters. So this is a common scenario that you see after you do the he he echo as well as hemodynamics. So summarizing, I've been in time, right? Case selection is important. Attention to detail at each step is essential. There should be a low threshold to place multiple clips provided you have an adequate orifice and use both echo as well as invasive hemodynamics in assessing of details. And the other thing is that do not put an arterial line in the groin. We never put arterial lines in the groin. If you need one, put just a radial line in. So it just minimizes bleeding. All patients uh, go from the cath lab to the floor. They never go to the ICU unless the patient was critically sick before. And you, even if the patient has a very low ejection fraction, we don't follow them in the ICU. Thank you very much. Mm. Question? Yeah. How many clips are there? It's, I think, 920 now in Cedars. So that's the largest experience, and we are hoping. Uh, I have done 90% of the cases. Mm. Now Raj is doing that. In fact, I, since you saw this picture, I actually want to show you the picture of mm. Fallon Powell. Fallon Powell was the CEO of the company who actually uh, helped in developing the microclip, and uh, oh. she, she died yeah. a few years ago of a, of a motorcycle accident. A few years, 2015, uh, 15, in a motorcycle accident. And she was only 51 when she died. The sad part is that she never saw the success of her own procedure. Hmm. She was there from the beginning. She was there from the beginning. Yeah. She fought. That's right. And she was way above every people. She actually wanted this to be for all people, all patients. That's very sad. Saibal, you've done a, a wonderful job of uh, developing this field. And I. I love doing the procedure. It really, uh, it's a team. It's working with other people. So many of the nuances you pointed out um, took some time to learn. And uh, so what do you think the learning curve is now in terms of someone who wants to get into this exciting field and be able to treat these patients? How, how, how do you look upon that training and um, so this, getting first of all, this is good. one specialty where I've seen a lot of uh, pediatric cardiologists getting involved in because it's something which they're very used to, three, working in three-dimensional spaces with ECHO. So they've actually done very well, mm -hmm. like Scott is one of them. Uh, it's, it's going to be, the learning curve is smaller now compared to what it was before us. And the reason is development of 3D ECHO. When we started in 2005 or three, there was no three-dimensional ECHO. We could never see a valve end face. We were just imagining What's the biplane and X-plane? I think three-dimensional echocardiography changed everything for us. Uh, it became much easier to do. So, and of course, remember we started 2005, we didn't even know how to do a transeptal puncture correctly. So we, would lear we learned it from the mitochondrial procedure. So I think now it takes about 15 or 20 cases for people to do pretty okay. The number that we found in a study was 35 cases. That if, if you did more than 35 cases, your success rate was more than 90%. And now it's about above ninety five percent. So the so the number as you know, mitral stenosis is anything above four, right? So four is the cutoff for normal, right? And ten is severe MS. Yeah. So for a normal person. So what we do is that if uh, you get a first clip procedure and the gradient is four, let's say it's four, then you have to question, is this four millimeter gradient because of MR or a combination of MR and MS? Because you can get a gradient because of increased flow. So what we then do, we would do a planimetry of the valve area. And if the planimetry combined is greater than two square centimeters, then I'm happy to try the second clip but I would not accept a greater than six or seven. If it's more than six or seven, because usually otherwise what happens the next day when you do the uh, transthoracic echo, it's always higher. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like five is acceptable. I think more than five, I won't take it. So you just yeah. Yeah. Two areas yes. Do they, yeah. Thing? Yes, I've seen numerically. Right. For, I'll give you a scenario like this. Say, Eric, let's say I put two, uh, one clip in, right? And one orifice is measuring two square centimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other one's one. So I automatically know it's above 2.5. So I put a second clip in. Even if the gradient is, you still want a gradient of less than five. I'm yes, yes, I yeah. would. Yeah, 
course. But it's again, more, uh, heart rate becomes very important. Yes, we also have to take into consideration the heart rate. That's uh -huh. right. If yeah, you're rating yeah. at a heart rate of 120 and you're getting a gradient of 5, then that's different. But if you're getting a patient whose heart rate is 60 or 70, and then the heart rate is five, uh, gradient is five, then you have to be careful. You, you've also volume loaded the patient a lot too by the end of the case, right? Uh, not necessarily, because that's actually down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's you believing, yes. Uh, a mitral annular calcification? Yeah, that's a very good question. That uh, can you do procedures with a patient who has mitral annular calcification? Because that's one thing the surgeons don't like at all. Provided if the effective orifice is greater than four and the leaflets are not involved in the MAC, then it's okay. Okay, that's great, Sybil. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. okay.